You're hanging out in the House of Sunny podcast, where it's always sunny, mostly because of your host, comedian and YouTuber, Sunny Loman. Want to know what Sunny and her friends are thinking about this week? Well, here she is, Sunny Loman. Welcome, everybody. I'm here with Sidekick Doug, and we have so much, so much news today. I was going to do kind of a quick show today because I'm in Florida, and we'll still try to do that, but we just have a lot of news, don't we? Yeah, we do, unfortunately. So I... I'm uh, vacationing in Florida and with you know my my four year old. We're here visiting her grandfather and uh, grandmother, and we're having a good time. It's warm. I got a suntan. Went to the beach today. Went went to Disney on Tuesday. Did you get any exercise walking from the parking lot to the park? Oh my God! Did you get your marathon in. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that before I went? <laughs> that took me by surprise. It took an hour just to get in the park. What is that? I mean, I didn't even know that. If I'd known that, we would have gotten there an hour earlier. Yeah. Well, what did you think you were um, going like, to just pull up and park in front, in the front row? I kind of thought that's how you do it. <laughs> I did. I, am I Is that naive? And then, it's a mile and a half away from the parking lot. Oh, you got to take a helicopter. Magic Kingdom. Yeah. So it's very organized, very efficient. But it takes forever, and I don't think I've ever been anywhere with so many people. I just, you know, maybe the Minnesota State Fair, you feel a similar crush of people, but... Now, did you actually get to go insane. on any rides, or were the, were the lines yes. so long that you only got two rides in? No, we went on... We, I did some of those fast passes. You can, yeah. you can make reservations. Mm-hmm. And I did some of those, and we did... We waited in line for It's a Small World for 40 minutes. Okay. And then I found out after we did that. So, you know, I've been really anemic. And I just don't, I didn't think I would have the energy to do the whole show, the whole park all day like that. And I also was there with my my dad and his sister. And they're both in their mid-70s. Mm. So I rented one of those motorized scooters. Ah. And I thought, like, as a family, you know, we'll just, we'll have this motorized scooter. We can take turns sitting instead of walking so much. And it turns out, and this is a a tip for anyone who wants to be a jerk. (laughs) If you have one of those, you can skip all the damn lines. There you go. There's a there's a section that you get in uh, if you have one of those. We could have been in It's a Small World within five minutes. You've now we didn't have to wait fifty minutes. You've now achieved true American status, like with the motorized scooter. Using- yeah, I was <laughs> I was thinking of that movie Wall-E, where all those like humans went into space after they ruined Earth to wait for Earth to sort of regenerate. <laughs> yeah, and they're on the ginormous cruise ship, and they're all just in these floating pods, and they're just getting fatter and fatter, and they don't have any bone structure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, your poor daughter. You know she's. Pick the three worst people to go to Disney with as a four-year-old. My anemic mom right? and my grandparents. Woo! My grandparents. Well, I did have her nanny, who's thankfully a 23-year-old, you know, oh, high-energy person. So, great. She has somebody to to look up to. Oh, that's great. But the picture, that I, have, I, have, I have several pictures of me at Disney with her, but one picture I have with with uh, us at Disney, my aunt snapped a photo of me sitting on the motorized scooter and her on my lap. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, there's us doing Disney with our sick mama. That's going to be a great memory. Great memory. You should think about deleting it. (laughs) You should, you should grab that scooter now and use it all the time. Like when you go to Walmart and stuff, you can really live the life. Oh my God. Right. It's a dream life. It, It is. You don't have to walk across the parking lot ever again. I should. Well, anyway, so, it, I without that, there's no way I could have made it the whole day. And as it was, my dad and I mean, like I said, I had my dad riding it sometimes, my aunt riding it sometimes. Um, yeah, and that's not unreasonable we, even for healthy people. It's a big part. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I mean, even if you're young and healthy, hell yeah. At the end of the day, you're freaking exhausted, and also you don't always find a nice, comfortable place to sit and rest. Right. And you could just pull that thing over in the shade and just kind of sit there and just relax and rest and recuperate a little bit. 
did you get any flack from anyone who recognized that you were just like you weren't really that handicapped? You were just using it for convenience. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody gave me any side eye. <laughs> but I, I think people realize like they don't really know what's going on with somebody. There's plenty of illnesses and stuff. See, I'm totally it. cynical. I just assume everyone's just gaming the system. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. Because you would. <laughs> exactly. I'm just All right. projecting. We, yeah, you are projecting. We've got some uh, jokes on the voicemail, so I'm going to do got two jokes. All right, here we go. Now you tell your joke. A gentleman went into a pharmacy and he requested to have an antidepressant. The guy says, Why do I need an antidepressant? He said, Well, it's the law. A picture of your wife and a no, 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 your no. marriage license no, is not, not enough. You need a prescription. You see that, right? Yeah. I walked into a Pharmacist What's says, happening here? Some antidepressants. The pharmacist says you need to have a doctor's prescription. A picture of your wife and marriage certificate isn't enough. I don't know what was going on there. That sounded like two people, two drunk people, no, I know, trying to call in a joke I know to who it the is. House it's of a Sunny of mine, podcast. And that's his father. I think he had his father reading the uh, reading the joke. telling the joke, and then he had to <laughs> intervene. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. And uh, Joke Man uh, also left a joke. Here we go. Okay, Sonny, I'm presuming this is the joke line, although your phone's messaging is messed up. Uh, after waiting an hour and a half for a date, Sarah decided she's been stood up. So she gets mad, goes, changes out of her dinner dress into pajamas and slippers, and makes some popcorn hot chocolate and starts watching some TV. So she sits down. Uh, door, but the front doorbell rings. Her dad goes out and answers. And there's her date. He looks in, sees her on the couch, and says, "What? I'm two hours late, and she's still not ready." Bye. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> what is her problem? Yeah, that's good. Oh, that was a good one. All right, if you want to call us a jo in a joke for next week, call the number seven zero seven six eight one five eight three four, and we'll play it because we play them all. Uh, dirty or obscene, swearing, we play them all, whatever you want to do. Hey, uh, also, go check out, we did, while I was on hiatus, Doug and I did a video response, or an audio response to a socialism video put out by Al Jazeera. It was actually a really good video, a very good piece of propaganda for socialism. Go check that out. You can see that on my YouTube channel, House of Sunny. Um, I think it's up there. Yeah, I made it public now, so you can go check that out. And we got a lot of really positive feedback on that. We released it just to our Elite Squad, which are our patrons through pat patreon.com slash houseofsunny. They got it first, and a few weeks later we released it to the public. And we are going to do some more of those because, really, we got so much positive feedback on that that... It's really the most positive feedback we've ever had. So obviously, uh, we're doing it. We were doing something you guys liked. So send us, if you guys come across videos that really bother you, send them to us and we'll, we'll do some responses. Yeah, so that could become one like thing, a thing. Yeah, we could do that as a thing. We might, we might be able to get one of those done a month, maybe more. Uh, one thing I have found is that by liking the moveon.org page on Facebook, they post a an egregious, hmm. despicable video about once a week. So. <laughs> <There's> no <laughs> we'll find something on that. There's no shortage of these uh, really effective propaganda pieces out there. So there's so much news today. There's election news. There's the Trump press conference, which in in and of itself is news because it's Trump and it's CNN. There's Jeff Sessions got fired. There's Tucker Carlson is being was attacked at his house. We got lots of stuff. Let's start with the election. I don't want to talk too much about it. We all know what the results were. Everybody's got a comment on it. I'm hearing a lot of positive spin, and my take is this was not good. We should have retained power in both the House and the Senate. That would have been good. Everything else sucks because what it means that we're not going to get in the next two years, we're not going to get an Obamacare repeal. We're not going to get any kind of immigration reform. 
for those of you who want the wall, we're not going to get a wall, you know, any more than, than Trump can kind of cobble together with his, the budget he already has. We're not going to get tax cuts. We're just going to get drama, drama coming out of the crazy house. And I know some people are saying, oh, that will be really good for the 2020 election. And that's why this is good. I'm sorry. I'd rather have results in my favor over the next two years than then more drama to make me even more exhausted. We're now, have you heard this new term? The exhausted majority? <laughs> have you heard this? <laughs> no, that's perfect. The exhausted majority are all of us out here who are just right and left, who are sick of the freaking drama. The drama of politics these days. Right. Did you hear what the, uh, the one of the senior legislators, one of the Democrats said is going to be his first priority? No. Trump's tax returns. So here we've got oh, great. twenty trillion dollars of debt. Yes. You know, all the problems we have in the world, right? Including Yeah, they keep complaining about how, how we have to let in all these illegal immigrants because our immigration policy is so bad. Why isn't that one of their things they want to do? Oh, uh, pass like sure. some immigration reform. Or health care or immigration or anything. Um, oh, Nancy Pelosi said she's definitely going to focus on health care. And but to them that means single payer. Mm -hmm. That means an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. And um, because obviously Obamacare is not working, everybody knows it. They want they want single payer because Obamacare sucks. And we're going to end up with that because it's going to get so bad that people are going to beg for single payer. Yep. It's going to be too painful, and too many people are going to die to get off of Obamacare and get back into the free market and wait for the system to work. Well, that's because both and, sides have accepted uh, restricted um, condition. I pro God, I can't even think of the word. Pre-existing conditions. Both sides yes, have accepted both that both sides have principle. accepted that. That's and you right. can't take it away now. So that's Listen, I, I do, I think there's something there, and I'm willing to, cons I think that this is a totally easy fix. I mean, I'm a person with a pre-existing condition. This is an easy fix. Um, you have to go ahead and put everybody, make it the way it was. I had a pre-existing condition before Obamacare, and one year I had to get new insurance. By the way, the only reason I had to do this was because I switched jobs. So if you can just untie insurance from jobs, mm -hmm. I would appreciate that. People who are sick would appreciate that. And so that's number one, but that, of, co of course, doesn't help you until you you buy it when you're healthy and then you get sick. So, But that will help everybody coming up, young people getting older, get their insurance. It's their same insurance for two decades, you know, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, but we can't do that. So you've got all these people out there with illnesses. For those people, give them a monthly fucking cash subsidy. <laughs> Just put some money in my pocket and... Other people who are sick, do that. Just give them money. It would be so much cheaper yeah. than what's going on right now. Just, and then expanding Medicare and Medicaid. Just give me a cash subsidy. You know, between the system we have now and that, it's like, why don't we just liberate the system for everybody and then just all the 10% uh, the of just people, just give them cash. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, instead, liberate the system <laughs> and give cash to 10% of the people, or however many it is. It's not even that many. So that's what I and, think. But instead, we're going to get Trump's tax returns. Yeah, um, right. I'm so happy. So that's exactly what I'm saying. It's just going to be drama. It's going to be Trump impeachment. It's going to be, you know, Kavanaugh impeachment, potentially. I don't know. Uh, you know, the crazy that's going to come out of the House is going to be entertaining. It's going to be good for us, Doug. Well, I think if the economy keeps going, I think the economy is going to go through a recession. And like like you just said, I think there's definitely an argument that you know, he now has a free option because if the economy does well, he takes credit. If it does bad, he says, ah, oh, look, the Democrats screwed it all up. So he came in and screwed it up. I couldn't tax. <laughs> I couldn't pass tax cuts. I couldn't pass. Well, and you know, the budgets are going to be out of control. So that's it. But they have been. Yeah. It's not I mean, like the, Republicans. Listen, the Republicans have no one. But I mean, first of all, like, the, I think this was the best out of like three out of the three elections in 100 years the sitting party, the presidential party, got Senate seats. So historically, this wasn't that bad compared to how it's been, you know, for like the last few right. years. Um, but
But, you know, what concerns me is this election was really about nothing. I mean, like we just said, I mean, here, people, most people are worried about their health insurance premiums. They're worried about mm -hmm. whether their neighborhood's safe, the quality mm -hmm. of schools. Um, you know, we have a massive problem with education in this country. Um, we have a massive oh amount God, of debt. Right? Um, yeah. And these people are talking about tax returns and impeachment and, to, and Russian collusion. I, I kind of hope they keep down that path because I think it will. Well, they will. Shred, There's no question that they will. It'll shred the Democratic Party. Well, you, why hasn't it already? This is what kind of freaks me out. And we can go right from that into what's happened with Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Um, Antifa showed up at his house. Yes. And his wife was home alone. With their daughters. And they were, what? His daughters, four daughters. Oh, no. The kids weren't oh, there, okay. I heard. Sorry. But anyway, his wife was there alone. But he does have four children. Um, but anyway, there was a mob outside his door. They were throwing themselves at the door to the extent that they cracked the door. She locked herself in a pantry and called 911. And they were yelling stuff like, this is just the beginning. And there's all this stuff on social media from this group, this Antifa group. So it was definitely Antifa. And I'm so happy to see all the Democrats that came out and condemned what happened to Tucker Carlson. And you're not being sarcastic. I think a lot of them That's did. That's a sarcastic joke. Well, I'm I, being totally so, sarcastic. <laughs> well, some of them did. There were like a number of commentators and other networks and stuff definitely came out and criticized. It. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to see that because typically you don't hear peep from them when, right. when the left gets violent. They, they don't say anything. So they're, you know, they're really sanctioning it. And anyway, that's... And Twitter I'm, suspended the account of that smash racism DC group. So that was good oh, to good. see. So there was a little bit of backlash. Um, you know, Tucker Carlson is one of my favorite people out there. I'm, I'm sure he mm -hmm. is for you, too. He is really thoughtful. He's not particularly partisan. I mean, he's right. just a really good thinker, and he's got a great spirit about him, and mm -hmm. he's a good guy. And um, for them to go after I just want to say that I, I've had some personal interactions with him because my videos used to be on The Daily Caller. He he does he made the decision to buy my weekly video and put it on the Daily Caller, and so I had some email exchanges with him. This was years ago, and he was so nice, and I'm just this nobody, you know. And he runs the Daily Caller, and he was just wonderful to me, complimentary, just really sweet. It's awesome. So it's like, it's real. What you see is that's the guy. And, and for them to go after someone like him, I think is like jumping the shark. You know, I, if there could be such a thing for these people, at least in Do the public perception. you feel like reception. it's jumping the shark? I feel like it's just the, we're at the beginning of this kind of mob behavior. Yeah, I don't, it's a good question. Um, I do think we're probably just at the beginning because there's a segment of these people that are essentially religious zealots. And it's not like they'll be converted. I think the best we can hope for is that they get marginalized by their own side because there's a split in the Democratic Party between sort of the old Democrats and the left and the progressive hard left. And they're really at odds. And, I, I you know, if we see the the more mainstream Democrats start to marginalize those people, it'll be a great thing for our country. I don't know that they are, though. It seems like they're going the other direction. So It does seem like they're going the other direction because – you know, Keith Ellison. Yep. Tom Perez. Um, Keith Ellison, who won his attorney. He's going to be the attorney general of Minnesota. This means he's he's law enforcement in Minnesota. This guy is corrupt. He's allegedly a white, you know, a girlfriend beater. Two women came forward, some with evidence. Um, in fact, both had evidence. One had a video and the other one had a had a hospital report. So they didn't, it wasn't just a, she said, you know, he said thing. And you could just tell by the way he talks, he's a bully. Um, but he's also has said very anti-Semitic things in the past. The guy's just a really bad dude. And not only was he made deputy of the DNC, but now he's attorney general of Minnesota. They keep, they keep electing actual socialists and communists into office. Mayor de Blasio. 
um, Ocasio-Cortez. And now this Ilan Omar from Minnesota, also this Somali mm -hmm. from, um, she's not, she's a socialist, but also she's Sharia supporting fairly overtly. So she's aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. She, when it's there's a terrorist attack. It's definitely going in that direction. And, um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's the future of the Democrat Party. Yeah. And they say that. I mean, they... They say explicitly so. that this is the direction they want to go. So yeah, it's yeah, going to be decided. ugly. I think I think with this Ginsburg thing, you know, this I guess Ruth Bader Ginsburg fell and is in the hospital. I mean, if she mm -hmm. retires, she's eighty five and she has bad health. I think that could precipita precipitate a civil war. I guess Rachel Maddow. Well, Kavanaugh was pretty crazy. Well, how they reacted to Kavanaugh. Right. Um, so yeah, getting another one. Imagine. Uh, yeah. I mean, Maddow's organizing. What did Maddow do? She's organizing this protest because Sessions resigned. So their theory is constitutional crisis <laughs> because Jeff Jeff Sessions resigned and he had recused himself. From the oh, Russia I thought case. you were going to relate that to the Ginsburg thing. Well, I am because she's organizing a rally in D.C. simply because we've got a new attorney general or a sitting a, or a backup mm. attorney general. So what I'm saying I is, see. if they're rioting and organizing. Are you there? This is it. She lost? said something like, um, I just lost you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear uh, you. Um, so Maddow said something like, this is the break the glass moment. Because what does that mean exactly? Break the glass moment? Like this is the emergency. This is the constitutional crisis that we've anticipated. And now we're breaking the glass, you know, like in case how of fire. Can, how can these people say that with a straight face when they have no regard, respect, or understanding of the Constitution? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, I, I, she really, I was, so, back to Tucker Carlson. There's this great interview with Tucker Carlson, and he's on Adam Carolla's podcast. I'm kind of a regular Adam Carolla listener. And Adam Carolla isn't, really conservative. I'd say his politics are kind of conservative libertarian, I guess, but sometimes uh, Democrat. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of all over the place, but at this point he's, um, he's really sick and tired of the left. And he's got a movie coming out called uh, Safe Spaces, I think, where that he's teamed up with Dennis Prager, like Mr. Conservative. To make this movie, I think the movie's going to be great. It's supposed to explore comedy and universities and how the culture is becoming really restrictive to speech. And anyway, so he's, I, I think my politics are pretty in line with Adam Carolla's for the most part. He's a very common sense guy, didn't go to college um, to be, you know, programmed, but he's really smart. Anyway, he had Tucker on and you and I have been talking about this offline, so we're going to talk about it here. But he, it's a great show. You should listen to the whole interview because it's really good. But Tucker made a comment. Adam Carolla asked Tucker why his opponents, leftist progressives, don't try to study or think about our side, but the right attempts to understand them. And he's like, why is that? And Tucker, this is a direct quote that I'm going to read you here. They're not having a political debate. They're waging a theological war where they believe that they've won the argument before it begins. They know that they are virtuous and you are sinful. They're saved and you're doomed. And their job is to convert you by force, period. So we're not having the same conversation from the same starting point at all. And our mistake is imagining that we are, that we can win over someone who has a religious, that is a religious zealot. You can't. As an atheist, you must already know that. So keep in mind, you are arguing with religious people. They don't believe in God, but it doesn't make them any less religious. And so the point there is that mentally, they're just like religious people where they're, they're not really at the stage of being open to argument. They just believe. They believe in the Democrat Party. And this is what, like, Maddow, this is kind of where she's at and her followers or, or her, her fans. But for her to, like, say constitutional crisis and them to bring up that language, they don't, they don't bother to know what they, what they even are saying. And I'm to the point where I feel like 
what you just read the quote of Rachel Maddow and what she's saying, like, this is a glass breaking moment. We're done. Um, that's kind of where I feel like we're almost to that on, you know, from our perspective. And I'm saying that in a real reasoned way. I think uh, the last story we're going to get to today is on the payday lenders and how the FDIC was completely threatening the banks to shut down accounts of companies that they just didn't like morally. They just kind of, some, some head guy over there doesn't like it. He's going to shut it down using the pressure and the authority he has as a regulator. And that's kind of where we are in the country. And this, this is the kind of thing that outrages me, not Trump's tax returns. But when the government power is used to destroy people. And Trump can fire Jeff Sessions. Like, that's constitutional. That's the administrative branch. He could have fired Rod Rosenstein and Jeff. He should have fired Jeff Sessions right when Jeff recused himself. Yep. If he has a, an attorney general who can't handle maybe the biggest thing that the Justice Department is doing right now, then why? How can he even do the job? Right. So, and then to put, and then Rod Rosenstein and that little schmuck just watching his testimony and how righteous and disgusting and despicable he is, and what a Trump hater. I mean, it's all just so icky. Trump should have fired those people a long time ago, but he didn't probably because he didn't think he could do it and survive politically. Um, two years later, there's no evidence of collusion. Um, and now he's fired Jeff Sessions, whom he doesn't get along with and like. The president needs to get along with the Justice Department. There's no evidence of the Justice of Trump or the Justice Department under Trump or any government organization under Trump pressuring any private citizen or private company. There's none of that. There's no story about that. And there were tons of examples of that under Obama. And people are worried about Trump. Uh, and this is the constitutional crisis. Yeah, we had the IRS auditing and preventing political groups from forming and getting nonprofit status with the Lois Lerner scandal. We had, and the Justice Department covered that up, um, as, as well as the, the gun scandal, the Fast and Furious. And then we've got this thing called Operation Choke Point, where the FDIC was... Well, I don't want to get into that yet. We'll get into that later. I, was, I'm, I want to talk about Jeff Sessions, and that's our last news story today. No, I know, but I'm saying that my point is, is that you had an egregious, out-of-control Justice Department under Obama, right. and right. we had, totally. had not a peep from the well, media. I remember when the when the Black Panthers were were blocking voting, yeah, uh, voting places, and Eric Holder's like, no, that's no big deal. I'm not going to do anything about that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so even the things they didn't do or refused to do, the the justice that they wouldn't go after, um, but he sure as hell went after states who passed voter ID laws. <laughs> So that's politicizing the Justice Department. There's no evidence that Trump has done that. So no, quite the I'm opposite. glad he fired Jeff Sessions. Quite the I'm really glad. It's quite the opposite. I mean, they've been resisting. The Justice Department has been resisting congressional committees' subpoenas for records and documents. They've been not complying with these congressional committees that are investigating right. this stuff. So it's been the opposite of... You know, it's like Trump's had to get had to come in and try and force them to declassify documents and get them to comply. Right. With Congress. Right. Yeah. It's like we have a rogue Justice Department for two years. And this guy's missing an action. And he finally and he resigns like just about every president has, you know, people in his cabinet that resign and Sessions is gone. He has a new attorney general, and it's a constitutional crisis. Are you kidding me? Right. But what? So, what do you think is going to happen to Rod Rosenstein? Uh, well, you know, he's conflicted too because he's he's part of the <laughs> he he's an eyewitness and part of the crimes they're investigating. But beyond that, I think that somehow he's going to survive. I think it might be politically. A problem for him to fire him, but I think once Mueller wraps up, I think he's gone. Mueller is supposed to re release some information soon. 
right? He said after the election, yeah, he's su- going to release Supposedly, his that's going to ramp up again now. Um, so it's probably two years. Trump saying, I want someone new in there to deal with this, whatever this information is. I want someone new in there to deal with this. Right. Uh, Rosen's- two years, and by the way, nothing yet. And you know that we would have heard of it if there was anything, because there, there have been leaks about everything. Right. There's no Russian collusion. Two years. Let's end this investigation. And in fact, the only Russian collusion was on the part of Hillary and the Democrats. Right. And that, we're not and that was never investigated by, once again, by Jeff Sessions. Right. Now, why do you think Trump hasn't fired him until now? Sessions? Mm-hmm. I think he wanted to wait till the midterms were over to not create like a political crisis because he knew the Democrats would freak out or it would be spun by the media as Trump trying to um, undermine Mueller's investigation. So he didn't want to give him that um, that talking point. Yeah. So I think that's I, what guess. I, I guess that's that's what it was. I guess. Well, he's gone. I'm glad there was a really funny onion headline that said. Jeff Session attempts to commit suicide by smoking a joint. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) So funny. Um, Okay, speaking of the media, so Trump does this press conference after the midterms, and Jim Acosta, I think everybody has seen this so far, Jim Acosta was his typical rude, belligerent self. He's this way with Sarah Sanders every day. He got that way with Trump. He's been that way with Trump before, and wasn't he the guy that almost created an international incident by yelling out questions to, like, was it Kim Jong-un? I don't, I can't remember exactly what it I was. I don't remember Or was that. it Putin? It was Putin. Um, just, the guy is obviously, the guy is just there for ratings, and he's just belligerent. He just creates drama. He's not really trying to collect news. So they finally booted the guy off the press corps. The, the White House press corps. And I can't believe it took him two years to do that. This guy's been so bad. Yeah, well, he... But again, it's like they, they, they give so many chances, and now Jim Acosta's out there saying, oh, it's an assault on, free, on ah. journalism, and um, did you see how rude he was? Well, the only person that was assaulting journalism was Jim Acosta. He right. grabs the mic, <laughs> starts debating Trump, uh, yeah. Which is cutting into the time of his colleagues who also want to ask questions. So he won't turn the mic over. Trump answers his questions and says, OK, give me the mic. The intern goes over to him and he pushed her away. He like kind of hit her arm. You know, this little mm-hmm. girl White House intern. And he refused to relent. And so, you know, not only is he not asking questions, but debating the president and acting like a belligerent, he's actually you know, hurting his own colleagues who, ha- who right. don't have a chance to ask the questions. Who have come to his defense, of course. Yeah. Because well, they're all leftists. Right. And that was funny, though, when the, the next guy got the mic and Trump told Acosta he's a rude and terrible person. And Peter Alexander from MSNBC said, well, in Jim's defense, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with him and he's a diligent guy who busts his butt. And Trump goes, well, I'm not a big fan of yours either. <laughs> who was that who said that this, this guy from nbc i think his name's peter okay. alexander he was trying to defend oh, Acosta. That's so funny. and trump's just like yeah well i'm not a big fan of yours <laughs> so great that's so funny i thought trump oh was God. gonna punch him i mean it looked it's just a total disgrace i mean it's not journalism. trump was really pissed he, he walked away from the mic it's so disrespectful Came bad and you're a rude horrible person and he is i mean it's not even just like Oh, it's the president of the United States. Show some respect, although there's that. But in any circumstance where somebody's at the mic, you're the, holding a press conference. I don't know. The whole thing. He's just so obviously rude. He's so gross. I think what CNN should do is give Jim Acosta a reality show. Because that's what he wants. And that's what they want anyway. They just want him to be like Jim Kardashian Acosta. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, he can just go yell at Trump from the sidewalk. Yeah. Um, and talk about his his hair and his Botox and, uh, you know, whatever else is going on in his his uh, narcissistic life. And I love how Acosta asked him, like, he was talking about the migrants, uh, this caravan, as if they're not real. And Trump goes, do you think these were actors? I mean, these are like, <laughs> these are real people. 
you know, and it's yeah. his job to enforce the law. You know, it's not to right. bring the country together or something I, like I that. I loved his comment, why don't you let me run the country and I'll let you run CNN? Yeah. <laughs> they have such low ratings anyways, he goes. Yeah. So great. But, you know, he was really, he, he answered really well. He just said, well, I think it is an invasion. It's just a difference of opinion we have. Yeah. Like, get over yourself, Jim Acosta. You know? Yeah. Jim Acosta's in there lecturing Trump. I wish, you know, we could play it, but I'm sure everybody has heard it. If you haven't heard it, just go Google Jim Acosta Trump press conference, and I'm sure it'll be the first oh, thing that pops up. It was a pretty big deal. And so now he's been he's been booted off off of that, and I'm sure there's an uproar about that too. I guess I'm just so I'm going to read the last story, and then we can kind of give some overall state of the culture comments. Uh, the last story is on this payday lender. So it came out, and I don't even know for sure why this information is just coming out now. It's from it's from like eight years ago. It's from when Eric Holder was in the justice was the uh, head of the Justice Department, and. I'm sure you all remember this if you were paying any attention at all, but there was kind of a scandal that uh, gun manufacturers were losing their bank accounts and payday lenders were losing their bank accounts and there was there were some porn actresses that were losing their bank accounts. I mean, it was like this weird assault on certain industries and one of the major players in that, I remember, was Bank of America. Bank of America was basically doing the bidding of the Justice Department. And it's now come out that the Justice Department, working in concert with the FDIC, which is the bank regulation entity, high-ranking officials at the FDIC and the Justice Department were involved in pressuring banks to cancel the, to not bank with payday lenders. That's what's come out now is specifically with these payday lenders. There's evidence, there are emails that show them talking about it, directing one another to talk to, directing the regional FDIC people to, that there cannot be a bank left that is doing business with these payday lenders. We want to crush this industry. We don't like them. We think they're not good for people. And so, by the way, these payday lenders... These are people who give cash for paychecks. So this is, a, this is an industry that sprung up for a need for people who are really poor. Paycheck to paycheck people. And that's who the government decided to shut down. The elites in Washington decide, oh... We can't allow this to happen. You don't need this service. This service is bad for you, poor people. Yeah, it's predatory. Because it's predatory. These companies are making too much money off of you. And, and, and without them, these people can't get their money right away because they put their check in a bank and they have to wait four or five days for the cash to show up in their accounts. And if it's Friday, that means they don't get their money till Monday. So these people are paycheck to paycheck people and they're desperate to get their money today. It also, by the way, benefits illegals. That's how they get their money because they don't have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So they take checks to these payday lenders and they get cash. So you're targeting people at the low, low end of society when you shut down these lenders. And, but the elites decided that's what needed to happen. They sent emails to each other saying, do it, do it, do it. And then uh, uh, this is how they did it. They even wrote down how they did it. They specifically said, one high-ranking official at the FDIC said, quote, you know, be sure to tell him, are you aware, or, or I said to him, are you aware that bank directors can be subject to criminal prosecution? That's a, that's a threat. Right. And, and then in the next email it says something like, let's make sure the bank doesn't say the reason they're, they're canceling these accounts is because we pressured them. So then, you know, wanting to hide it. So, you know, we knew some shit went down under Obama. And, you know, presumably maybe there's still some stuff going on now. I don't know. We're just finding about, out about this eight years later. And they're doing this against like the firearms actual dealers, too. Think- yeah, they did this against firearms dealers or manufacturers. I mean, they, they can target and attack any company that they don't like. 
And now you've got a situation where I keep seeing PayPal as one of these major deplatforming companies. And PayPal is regulated by the FDIC. So what makes you think they're not getting pressure behind the scenes from the Justice Department, which is not conservative? Right. I mean, these are, these are bureaucrats. Right. They're in there all the time. The FDIC is bureaucrats. They're not elected people. Trump doesn't get to go clean out the FDIC. Right. And clearly, the high-ranking people at these, at these bureaucratic companies are pro-big government. And pro, which of course they are, right? I mean, that would be their tendency. That's their that's their employer. Yeah, and we well, and that's the point is we don't know. It probably depends on the bureaucrats, right? And that's what makes it scary. Yeah. Is there's, you know, what? A, okay, so maybe next year the head of the FDIC is a conservative Republican, and he's trying to shut down things he doesn't like. And then next year it's an Obama guy. Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Planned Parenthood doesn't get to bank anymore. How would we like that? Right. Or, you know, pot pot businesses or something like that, you know, or right. whatever he doesn't like, he shuts down. And they threaten right. him with this, you know, tagging these these companies as high risk companies. And so right. and in you know, if you're a bank and a regulator says, Hey, this is a high risk customer, you don't screw around. You just shut down the account. I mean you're Especially when they say to you, Are you aware that you personally could be subject to criminal prosecution? Definitely. If you bank with these high risk companies, that's what they said to the people running the banks. And um, I'm sorry, but you know what are you going to do? You're going to do what your regulator tells you to do. These are not free companies. This is fascism. This is fascism. And for those out there who make arguments against, you know, we talk about social media companies and others, and they say, well, if you don't like it, just start your own business. You know, if you don't like what a company's yes. doing, well, you know, in a in a laissez-faire economy, that's true. You just go to the next bank or, you know, you go to the next digital platform or whatever, you know, you find their competitor in a situation right. where we have a nationalized, essentially like semi-fascist banking system. Um, you know, is it semi-fascist? That's fascism. It's privately owned and controlled from the government. Right. Well, I'm just saying it's not like, I don't even think it's semi-private. These are barely private companies anymore. Yeah, that's probably fair characterization. I'm just saying that when when that's the case, you know, in a mixed in a mixed or fascist economy, um, it's totally yeah. legitimate to seek consumer protection not only from the bureaucrats themselves but from the businesses because there are businesses that will use these bureaucrats, you know, to serve their own purposes. I mean, what if you have an unscrupulous <laughs> business man? Who wants to put his competition out of work or out of business? And you know yeah. he's he's buddies with a regulator, or someone down you know at the FDIC or wherever, and says, "Hey, you know you ought to take a look at this guy." And you know whatever. It's just the point is is that in a, in this context, it's completely legitimate to say we need consumer protection or we need some sort you know whether it's neutral platforms and social media or from these banks. You know, or the next thing you know, like, can, can conservatives drive on roads? Um, can conservatives open <laughs> bank accounts? I mean, Can we fly on airlines? Oh, they're private airlines. Just build your own airline. Right. Well, guess what? They're regulated by the FAA, and, you know, you need pilot's license, and you need, right. you know, they're heavily, heavily, heavily regulated. The airports are owned by the government. Yeah, so you don't just go start your own airline or start your own airport. Right. Um, right. It's not a good argument. It's just not the world we live in right now. No. And um, and I'm sad to say that. And I think what I was what I wanted to get at with all of this is that with Antifa, the mob, you know, the left kind of supporting this mob rule. Um, the left has gotten violent, and then I see the right kind of standing up to them sometimes, and then they get in trouble for not being civil. And I just don't really understand. I feel like people are being kind of naive, imagining where we are exactly in history right now. We're in a country that's partially fascist. Um, government's very powerful. The president of the United States can't even fire his own people. Like, he doesn't even have that kind of power. The The... I, I hate to use the deep state words, but, you know, the bureaucracy, I think, is a better word for it. The entrenched bureaucracy in D.C. is so big that they can control what's happening out here in America. 
who gets to bank, who gets to have nonprofit status, who gets audited, who doesn't. There was that one woman who started that nonprofit company and then her private business, which was like some kind of a manufacturing company, uh, was descended upon by three different federal agencies, including OSHA. Jesus. They'd never been audited before. And all of a sudden they were audited from like three different fronts. Um, and that was their private business. And then their, their nonprofit that they had started also got audited. So they just became you know, they became targets of the government. I mean, it was such obvious persecution. And the government has that power. So I kind of feel like when I read this story about the FDIC pressuring a bank to drop an American's, uh, an American business's account because he just didn't really like what the business the guy was in, that is, like, for me, I'm done. I feel like I'm ready to revolt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I see Democrats voting for Democrats, the you know, my neighbors who are Democrats, when they are continuing to vote for the people who could do what they did to Brett Kavanaugh, for the people who are, you know, tacitly then supporting Antifa, and people like Elizabeth Warren and people like Ocasio Cortez and communists, Bernie Sanders who was a member of the Communist Party when he was young and is now just a democratic socialist, which is just communism. Communism light, I guess. Communism with an election. Um, I don't think, I don't really see a way out of this except to declare that the left is completely wrong and evil and it's time to figure out how to get away from them. How to stop them and get away from them. There's so many of them now half the population, because they can now take the house, even after all of the crazy stuff they've done in the last two years, people are still voting for them. And maybe part of it is that not enough Republicans got out. I think Paul Ryan isn't the most inspiring person in the world. The house has been kind of a joke. And, you know, when they can't in two years repeal Obamacare and do things like that, I don't think people believe in them. And I don't think anybody gets out and votes anymore. You know, I think that's part of the problem. Well, I think part of the problem was the Republicans went from a position of arguing against Obama and being, you know, nipping at the heels of, of the Obama administration, which they had every right to do, to suddenly being in power. Like, okay, we've got the presidency. We've got both houses of Congress. Now what we do? Yeah. So you don't have a plan to repeal Obamacare? Like, you couldn't get well, that did. done they in two years? They just didn't want to do it. And then, and then they did pass that one with John McCain. Yeah, but it was horrible. It uh, was the deciding vote against it. It was a horrible bill. I mean, for them to not have gotten... Yeah, you're right. It was a horrible bill. It was horrible. It left, it left all the major features of Obamacare in. But, you know, to not have, like, hey, we're going to, like, just rip this out root and branch. And, you know, we're going to start right. over just with... Just repeal. A, a one paragraph. Repeal the act. Repeal. That's it. And, and we're going to start this thing over and have some really good people, you know, figure out how to liberate the system. I mean, you could have gone to the bank with that. I mean, people are really suffering. It's one of the biggest fears I think people have is yeah. getting health insurance. And even for people that are middle class or upper middle class, I mean, the premiums are, I, we all know the horror stories of healthcare yes. and it's a big, big deal. And it, a lot a of people said it's like the number one thing. People. And so, yeah you know, for them not to have, or, or, and not to have really passed any sort of real immigration reform and to right. just have let this go. And what did they do for two years? I mean, they didn't really, they have let it go so bad that we're at the situation where we have these caravans coming and, you know, the streaming, like it really is a problem. We need to, we need to have an immigration policy that people approve of that the American people like. Yeah. That, that this, then, this is the policy. And then and then we can get everybody behind border control, <laughs> you know? That's right. But, I mean, I'm, what I'm saying, I guess, is you have to articulate the message and not just argue against the other side, which is what the Democrats yeah. do now is Trump, Trump, Trump. It's all about him. Right. And they're right. obsessed with him. And they don't have a plan either. I mean, their plan is, well, Trump, you know, we want to get him. Right. Well, you know, you need more of a plan the Republicans needed a more, uh, you know, better plan than what they had. And well, it's time it, for me. I'm just, I'm just done with the Democrats. Like, I, I don't feel like there's persuasion available. Tucker said it best. They're religious. Um, I, I have friends on the left who post on Facebook and I see that I just, how can they not, 
maybe they're not aware. Maybe they're only watching mainstream media. I don't know. I don't really understand how anyone can vote Democrat right now because they're crazy. Yeah. And that's what you're voting for. You're voting for more unhinged insanity. And you're voting for, uh, I would say, more likelihood of civil war, which isn't going to be pretty. Do people think that's romantic? Because that's going to be super ugly. And, I mean, that's where we're headed right now. Yeah, when you get to this but, point of, like, religious zealotry on one side where the other side won't even argue or engage you in a conversation because right. they just regard you as, you know, a sinner. And when you get to this point, um, you're really – the choice is black or white. You know, there's no nuance. Yeah. There's no debate. It's not like, well, maybe the, it's just you're either on one side or the other, and this is what this type of religious thinking creates in a country, it creates – uh, a, a volatile situation that usually ends up in some sort of violence, which it already is, because you can't reason you, with them. Now, do you think there are people on the right who fit that bill? Um, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like I think there are people on the right who are in, who are religious about their politics. Oh yeah, no, yeah, no question. Um, that, I mean, it's a tough question because I think. It, it, you know, I think most of the people I've met, though, even religious conservatives, um, you know, they they kind of compartmentalize the religious aspect of their thinking, and they're actually, in a sense, less religious than the left, even though they're they go to church, and that yeah. you know they have religion in a certain part of their They've lives. They're good at compartmentalizing, and it, it informs their morality and their whole view of the world. Yeah. But they're not trying to force their religion down your throat. You know, whereas the religious left, you know, these zealots, they won't talk to you. They don't, they don't even, and, and it's not just that. They hate America. They hate the American system. They think the U.S. is responsible for all that's wrong in the world, for spoiling the environment and exploiting the third world and, you know, racism and, I mean, and you know, our history of you know, genocide and the patriarchy. I mean, they really want to tear America down. They, they yeah. hate the country and they don't. Yeah. That's kind of part of it. I would almost rather be around a religious zealot who loves America <laughs> <laughs> because at least like they do pay, they're religious about free speech. You know, it's like they may not really fully understand, but like, Oh, yeah, if you say to them, well, free speech, then they'll kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, you're right, I'm for free speech. They're for it. They're for it. The left isn't for it anymore. Yeah, and a lot of the religious anyway. people, even the religious right, though, I mean, the, you know, they're religious and that, that informs their morality, but they're usually reality-oriented yeah. people who are first-handed and who yeah. are business people. And there's people. certainly a percentage that aren't, and there's a yeah. percentage who support Trump no matter what he does. Yeah, um, no question. But, but who, or who... Who supported the GOP no matter what they did. Like the people who make me actually more sick than that are the Bushies. You oh. know, the people who like George Bush yeah. and who like the you know the The neocon types. Uh, the neocons. Those people I hate more than anybody. Cause they just want to pander to and apologize for American ideals and they they want to kiss up to the left. They're gross. They're gross. They don't stand for anything, really. No, they want to project American power. They love war. They love, you know, the surveillance state. I mean, they're not yeah. for civil liberties. McCain. McCain was a perfect example of that. Like, that kind of politician. And I saw Paul Ryan become that way from what I thought was a pretty decent politician when he was younger to once he became Romney's VP choice. Something happened there. Uh, you know, he sold his soul or something because after that he was just the shell of what it, what he was before. And now he's resigning because he's young. Even though he's young, he's exhausted. Exhausted from being a pansy ass. So do you think that, like, there needs to be sort of like a secession movement? Or, like, how do you think this plays out? I don't know. I don't know. But, I mean, I'm, I see I'm projecting forward. I don't see any way out of this. I, right now, I don't see that the left is going... There are plenty of people who've walked away. Yes, this election wasn't as bad as it could have been or whatever. But there's still enough people in the U.S. And there's more immigrants coming every day. And there aren't people saying, hey, we can't have all of these socialists coming in here. And they're going to come in. I, I mean, you know, 
I, I just, I see that the population of socialists is growing and the population of capitalists is shrinking. And, um, some on the left have been convinced to walk away. I don't really know where their allegiances lie in the end. Um, I don't know. I just, I personally don't really see a way out anymore. I see this going, getting worse and worse and worse until we're like Europe where free speech can be banned mm -hmm. and maybe we're disarmed. I don't know. I mean, at some point, what, at what point do we actually stand up and go, okay, I've had enough. The FDIC is telling banks that they have to close the banks of Americans, the bank accounts of Americans. The FDIC is doing that because mm -hmm. they don't like a certain business. To me, that right there is revolution. I'm ready to, to die on a hill for that one, you know? Yeah. That's so anti-American and so fascist that it's, it's so unfree. I don't see any way out of it except to completely revolt. How, how, do you, how else do you get rid of this kind of a bureaucracy? I could see it being done politically, but I just don't see the politicians willing to do it. And when you have someone like Trump, who actually is deregulating and has the ability to kind of fight some of this stuff and the temperament anyway to not give a shit when people criticize him and go crazy and the left goes crazy, he doesn't really seem to care. Um, that's kind of a special temperament. But even he's really not able to do that much. So that's kind of what, you know, I hate to be, I hate to be so negative, but yeah. I, I, I think, yeah, I think maybe we're headed toward, there's got to be a line somewhere in the sand. Well, I think, you know, it's going to come from one of two sides, either the left, like in a place like California is going to engage in more nullification where they just ignore federal law that they don't like. I think they will do and, that. Yeah. And, like the sanctuary cities is just ignoring and if, federal law. And if that continues to happen, it's going to do one of two things. Either the government, the federal government's going to have to go in there and like get violent to bring them in line or they're going to have to secede. And so, yeah. or, you know, if we get a, a, you know, a Cortez type president, who's a real rabid socialist, you could have more right wing states nullify Seceding. and saying, right. you know what, Texas just needs to be its own country again. I mean, I don't well, know if this thing's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 yeah. years, but I, that's where I see it going. Did you hear my dogs or my dad's dogs barking? No. He has two chihuahuas, Pablo and Rosita, <laughs> and he calls them anchor babies. <laughs> he calls them his anchor babies. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Anyway, that could stay here forever. Politically. Yeah. Tells you where my dad is. Uh, yeah, so on that positive note about the world is ending and we need a revolution. I, I Honestly, I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll keep watching it. Where else can you go with this? <laughs> There's nowhere to go. I don't know. We'll keep watching it. Hopefully we'll make fun of it. And um, we'll see what happens. But I, I'm getting more and more firmly in the conservative place. Um, I didn't used to like that word and I didn't used to define myself with that because it often meant religious and almost a fundamentalist religious. Um, and I can't, def I cannot associate myself with that or didn't want to. It was, it's kind of icky to me. Um, but I see more of that kind of religious fanaticism on the left right now. And so my natural instinct to be like, Hey, you don't get to tell me what to do. I don't like your emotionalism. I don't want a mob deciding what happens uh, or to the rest of us. I don't want them to moralize my life. I see all of that happening on the left, not the right. No, Sonny, you're exactly right, which is we should fear religion, but the manifestation of religion now, the kind of like Puritan witch trial level of religion right. that we all fear, that's going right. on on the left. That's where the bots the are. That's where the witch yes. trials are occurring. That's where the purges right. are going. That's the where, the, purges, where the people the, with pitchforks, right. the villagers with pitchforks trying to burn the witches, that's where yeah. they are. They're the religious That's where they crazies. are. I mean, we have to switch our thinking. It's not the Christians. No, the Christians are more libertarian. They're pretty chill. And I mean, look at Tucker Carlson. He is religious, and he's conservative, and he's almost a libertarian politically. I think he used to be a full-on libertarian. Yeah. But he's decided that government should be involved in a few more things than, yeah. than he previously thought. 
Um, but he's still pretty, he's pretty free market, but he's not. But he's open to reason. Um, you can talk yeah, to he's him. Yeah, he is open to reason. I he think, will yeah. debate you. He will try and prove his case. You know, right. He doesn't just call so his opponent a racist right. and try and kill him. Right. It's like, I can live with those people. I can't live with Antifa. So, it's interesting times we live in. Yeah. I, I You know, things can't stay this way. So, we'll see what happens. Anyway, I'm glad we have Trump. I think, I think that's good. And we have the Senate. But I'm pretty disappointed the House was lost. We're, we're not going to get any kind of Obamacare repeal. And um, we've got a couple years to try to get the House back, I guess. Yep. Probably doesn't matter that much. Yeah. Do, 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 do. That's the end of our show. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for our show today. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please leave comments on this show's comment section either on youtube or on facebook let me know what you think and the things we talk about we want to hear from you we will totally uh bring in your opinions into the show call in a joke especially we love that 707-681-5834 if you enjoy the show consider joining my patreon elite squad which is at patreon.com slash house of sunny we're completely fan funded you can get mugs t-shirts secret facebook group and more Join us and we will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the House of Sunny podcast. Go check out Sunny on YouTube at her channel, House of Sunny. Everything Sunny does is fan funded. And because she's likely to get kicked off and demonetized on every platform at some point, please support her over at patreon.com slash house of Sunny. Become one of Sunny's elite squad and have access to behind the scenes footage, t-shirts, special events, and more. Uh.